friends, Krista here. Thanks for stopping by Books and Jams. It is already halfway through the month of July. That's crazy. And my eyes are very watery. Huh? I'm here today to tell you about the books that I've already read this month, and there are 11 of them again. I was not expecting to have another big month like I did in June, but if we recall, six of them are middle grade books from my Newberry weekend, and so that ups my number quite a bit. So I'm just going to tell you about the books that I read in the month of July so far. Let's just dive in. At the very first weekend of July, I drove up to New York and visited my mom and my sister somewhat for my birthday, somewhat because I just wanted to go visit them. So I had a nine hour drive one way and then nine hours home. So I listened to three audiobooks right at the very beginning of the month. So the first one I read was Jane in Love by Rachel Givney. This is a giveaway that I won on Goodreads. Yay! Only maybe my second one that I've won after entering tons of them. Uh, anyways, this was my first Jane Austen July read for the year, and it's a Jane Austen time travel book. <laughs> Jane Austen, as we know, was a spinster. She never got married. And so in the beginning of this, she starts out at home. Her mom is trying to get her to stop writing so that she can focus on finding a husband. Jane doesn't want to stop writing. She had a hopeful suitor that didn't pan out. So she goes to visit this woman who's kind of like a witch. And this woman gives her almost like a curse that ends up into a portal into modern day Bath, which Jane didn't realize at the time, but that's what happened. She ends up in modern day Bath. So we read about what this woman from the eight, early 1800s experiences in modern day, in a modern day setting. It was kind of humorous and, and quirky and light. She lands on the set of a Northanger Abbey retelling or adaptation, I should say, which she hadn't written yet at that point. She befriends Sophia, who is a Hollywood starlet, kind of a fading Hollywood starlet and gets to know Sophia and her brother and learns about life in modern day Bath and has to decide ultimately between her two true loves. Like she finds her true love in the modern day setting, but also writing is her true love. And as she spends more and more time in the modern day, her books start to disappear and what's gonna happen. And so it was a very light and fun book. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a great car read on, on audio nothing blowing my mind. I did find the ending a little bit sad. Um, I do think it was the right ending, but yeah, you kind of are hopeful. I mean, it, it could have gone either way. So I, I but I think the right choice was made. <laughs> um, yeah, this was, this was a really cute, it was a really cute audiobook. The next audiobook that I listened to was The Masterpiece by Francine Rivers. I haven't read Francine Rivers in quite a while, other than the reread that I did of her Mark of the Lion trilogy at the beginning of the year. And I haven't read any of her contemporaries in a really long time. And I gotta say, they're not my favorite. I did like this book. I thought it was well done. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second, but I do prefer her historical books. So the Mark of the Lion trilogy is set in ancient Rome, and then the Re Redeeming Love is kind of set in 1940s California Gold Rush time, and I do prefer those as opposed to these more contemporary ones, but she really does a great job at creating characters who are feel who feel very realistic. Uh, in this one, we follow a young single mom who's really struggling, uh, gets a temp, she gets a temp job working for this artist, this like start, not starving artist. He's a very well off artist who is a grumpy, <laughs> super grumpy, super, uh, set in his ways, very hard. Like he had gone through like maybe seven or 11 other temps before this woman comes and she doesn't kind of put up with any of his crap, which he needs and appreciates. And of course they, begin not I wouldn't even call it a friendship at first but uh they begin to have some respect for each other they both have come from a past that they need to work through and that's what I appreciated about this Eat the two characters who we know are eventually going to have a relationship but they aren't each other's savior in this book at all they each individually on their own work through some of their stuff before the relationship ever comes to be and I really appreciated that um, this is a Christian fiction and a faith. It plays a huge part of this book. Uh, it is not on the sidelines. It's definitely woven all the way through. And it's not just characters showing up at church every once in a while. Um, so if that's not something that appeals to you, just be aware that this is a very faith-based book. And both of these characters find their healing and salvation through Jesus and 
what in the work that he and the, the work that God does in their lives and not in each other. And I did appreciate that because sometimes you read a, a somewhat romance book and and the man or the woman is the one who saves and rescues the other. And that is just not the case here at all. That felt very realistic and I appreciated that. And I liked that art was a big part of this. Roman is an artist and a very talented artist. So we get to see the different styles of art that he does and we learn about their past, which was emotional. I did tear up a couple times. I really enjoyed this. I, again, I prefer her historical works, but I think she does a beautiful job of creating story and characters. So this is a good one to read if you're interested in any of that. The third audiobook that I listened to on that trip was The Dictionary of Lost Words by Pip Williams. This book was one of my anticipated reads for spring or summer. I forget which now, but it is a historical fiction and it kind of chronicles the, the creation and the work that was put into the Oxford English Dictionary, which was so interesting. It was never actually stated in the book that that's what it was all about, the Oxford English Dictionary, but in the author's note, it does, it does talk about that. And it was so interesting to see the work that was done and how much time and effort was put into creating this multi-tome dictionary <laughs> that was supposed to chronicle the history and the definition and the etymology of every word in the English language. Well, is it every word? Not exactly. <laughs> so this book really explores the fact that the majority, the huge majority of people working on the, the dictionary were men. And so a lot of words that were more uh, almost slang, not slang, but colloquial or common or used mainly by women were not included. Uh, and so the daughter of one of the men who works on the dictionary gets to go to work with her dad. If he's a single dad, I'm not sure what happened to the mom. We might have learned at the beginning, but I don't remember. Um, the daughter goes with him all the time to the Scrippy, which is where they work, Scriptorium, where they work on the dictionary. And she, from a young age, hangs out at the Scrippy and sits under the table. And as Esme gets older, she starts to find little of scraps of paper that might have fallen off the, the table. And one of the words that gets de declined from use in the dictionary is bond maid. And she and her, her maid who care for her start to save some of these little scraps of paper. And as she gets older, she starts to hear words used at the market and with other women in the kitchen and she starts kind of her own collection of lost words that were not included in the book and I only ended up giving this three stars because while I did find the historical aspect of it very interesting and the the work on the dictionary so interesting I didn't end up caring for the characters themselves and I don't know that I just feel like there was something missing for me in this one. Uh, and, and also, a lot of the words <laughs> that she ends up writing down and, and trying to save or, or whatever were quite crass. And I don't know, it just it just felt, I don't want to say gratuitous, it just it just didn't feel meaningful. For some reason, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not very helpful here. But as I was listening to it, I would find myself zoning out. I would, and maybe that's because I was driving and I was paying attention to the road. That's good, good philosophy. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I just felt like there was something missing for me. There were parts, there were parts that were a little bit slower, a little bit more boring, not very much happening. You could definitely tell that the writer did a lot of research behind the creating of the dictionary and that was really cool. Oh, there was also a big time jump in here, which I have mentioned before that isn't my favorite thing. And we 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 learn after the time jump that something traumatic had happened to Esme and we don't really know what that was. We only learn about it secondhand. So, I mean, that kind of happens throughout the book. Like there's little jumps and there's little things that we learn about secondhand and maybe that's what contributes to me not feeling super connected to the characters, especially Esme. Yeah, I just, it was only a three star read for me. I'm gonna stop talking about it now because it was only okay. It was fine, but I'm done. <laughs> While I was in New York, I started this book on one of my lives that I did and that is Summer at Meadow Wood by Amy Rebecca Tan. And this was just such a nostalgic read for me. This is a middle grade 
about a young girl who gets sent away to summer camp for the summer, her and her brother. She is sent to the girls camp, he's sent to the boys camp. And she's really frustrated because um, she reads an email on her mom's computer and learns information about her mom that doesn't make her very happy and she feels like her mom is just getting her out of the way for the summer. At the beginning, I was really frustrated because we keep referring to this email, but never really learning what it says <laughs> until quite farther into the book. And I just, I felt like I was being dragged along for that part. And I really didn't appreciate that, like just those little teasers about that email. Like, just tell me what the email said already for crying out loud. Vic is our main girl. And I really did love her growth throughout the summer. She loves summer camp, but she really wanted to stay home and spend time with her fr her best friend, Jamie, who is the main character in Amy Rebecca Tan's other book, A Kind of Paradise. So that was kind of a fun little connection between the two. So she has her camp friends and they have a really close bond, the girls in her cabin. Her counselor doesn't seem like a counselor type, but ends up being just the counselor that, that Vic needs for this summer. Vic is an older sister to a newer camper who's who's coming in and is such a good big sister to her and really helps this other girl who's super smart and slightly awkward uh, helps her to make connections in her cabin there's just so much of this that was so sweet and so heartfelt Vic early on they have to sign up for like activities and because she was helping her little sister she didn't get to sign up and so she gets stuck with farming uh, and she has to work with the camp director's husband in the garden and she's really not happy about it at first but the garden becomes a place of comfort for her and helps her to process all that's going on in her life I don't know I just I love summer camp so much and I just thought that this was a very nostalgic and sweet read I ended up giving it four stars and I just loved it it was perfect to read in the summertime as well so good and I I really like Amy Rebecca Tan's writing so I'm happy to have read her newest one. Then I had my Newbery weekend. So I just feel like I talked about these pretty recently. So I'm not going to talk about them too much. I went in depth into what I thought about them and my, my ratings for them and the order that I liked them. So I'll just show them very quickly. I read The Midwife's Apprentice by Karen Cushman, Julie of the Wolves by Jean Craighead George, Dear Mr. Henshaw by Beverly Cleary, Strawberry Girl by Lois Lenski, the Cat Who Went to Heaven by Elizabeth Coatsworth, and The Matchlock Gun by Walter D. Edmonds, which you can't really see because here we go, The Matchlock Gun. So those were my six Newbery books that I read. I am excited that I got through a handful of them and I will probably continue to do those Newbery weekends occasionally because uh, I, I feel like that was super productive. And then just yesterday, I finished the third book in the Grisha trilogy, Ruin and Rising by Lee Bardugo. This was a fantastic conclusion to the series. I was surprised along the way. I was hopeful. I even teared up, which I was completely not expecting to happen in this fantasy series. But there was one scene as I was reading yesterday that had me crying a little bit. And I was like, what? <laughs> Uh, I like the growth and the change in the characters that we follow all the way through. Even the one side character, Zoya, who at the very beginning is a mean girl through and through. Uh, throughout the three books, we really get to see a different side to her and she doesn't really change who she is, but we see her loyal side. We see her leadership ability. We see her dedication to the cause, which I really appreciated getting to see like a more well-rounded side of her other than just this antagonistic unkind woman so it was really it was really cool to see a, a deeper side to even one of the side characters I think Lee Bardugo did such a fantastic job I can't really speak about the events of this one it does carry on from the other two and while book two had a more of a problem with pacing I feel like I was invested in this one all the way through um, I read it in three sittings I couldn't put it down I was just very very invested in finding out how it was all going to wrap up. And now I really kind of do want to read the Six of Crows duology again. And then I want to move on and read King of Stars, King of Scars. And I don't know, there's another one now after King of Scars, which I haven't read those two. I did, I have read the Six of Crows duology and really loved them. Actually, that's where I started with Lee Bardugo. But yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled that I finished this series. This was a four star read. And that is it. Those are the 11 books that I read at the beginning of July. No five-star reads. 
I'm hoping to get a couple five star reads before the end of the month. I'm currently in the middle of three books. One of them, one of them I can't show you because it's for kind of a secret, secret TBR sort of. I'm making my way through Les Mis. I'm actually right on target for where I should be for the live show on Saturday. So I'm very pleased about that. I found the first little section a little bit slow, but once we got to where Jean Valjean shows up, I have not been able to stop. I just love it so much. It's so good. It's so good. Last night I started Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. This will be my second second and the only and final contribution to Jane Austen July this month. I am halfway through. I'm on like 130, actually a little bit more because I listened to some more this morning, but I'm really enjoying this. I forgot. I've, I feel like I've only read Northanger Abbey maybe once. Catherine Moreland is this sweet, innocent young girl who is kind of quite naive about the people and the character of the people around her. Henry Tilney is wonderful. Um, her friend Isabel is a flirt and insincere and Catherine is so clueless. <laughs> she's so clueless. Um, and they've just now showed up at the Abbey. Um, she's gone with the Tilneys to stay with them for a week or so. And she's just infatuated with reading novels that are gothic in nature and slightly scary. And so she just whips up these scenarios in her mind and scares herself. And it's quite funny. And it's, it's super cute. I'm really enjoying, I'm really enjoying listening to this one. Uh, and then this week, just to give you a little taste of what's coming up, I'm starting two buddy reads very soon. Hopefully today I'm starting Keeper of Lost Cities with Amy Bowman. This is by Shannon Messenger. It's a middle grade. Um, they're quite chunker books, but I feel like because they're middle grade, they're going to go pretty quick. And I've heard so much praise for this series. And I hear that it just keeps getting better and better. So I'm excited to start that. Uh, and then in a couple days, maybe today, I forget when we're starting this one, but I'm reading this with two of my patrons, The Girl with a Louding Voice by Abby Dare. I'm very excited, very different from the other things I've been reading this month. Um, historical, somewhat historical, I think, set in Nigeria about a young girl who is really just wants to have an education, but is being forced to get married or something along those lines. And then the third one that I hope to start in the next couple days is The People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. This is my patron book club book for July and I haven't started it yet. So I'm really hoping to get that one started and finished this week. So that is where I am at with my reading so far this month. I would love to hear from you. How is your reading going in July? Have you been plowing through books or are you just kind of taking a break and relaxing? I would love to chat with you about that. And that is it for today. So be sure to comment down below. Let me know how your reading is going and talk about any of these books that I talked about today. You guys know I love talking with you down in the comments. So let's chat down there. Give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I will be talking with you in another video very soon. Bye. Thank you.